Hello and welcome. Today I'm joined by John Miles. John is a physio at the Welsh Rugby Union and I've known him for a number of years. We were just having a bit of a catch up on some of the old times. So, John, thank you for your time. Good to see you again. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, just in terms of your career, like how did you get involved in this area? I mean, you've obviously got the Welsh accent, but um, just talk to me about where you grew up. Um, so... I grew up on a farm in West Wales, um, a town called Fishguard. If anyone's ever got the ferry to Ireland, they, they'll have passed through Fishguard. There's not much there, bar a load of pubs. Um, but yeah, I grew up there and um, around about the age of 15, 16, realised that my older brother was going to take over the farm and, and um, I was going to have to find another job, basically. So I, I um, had to rush and find something that would suit me um, and I didn't want to do necessarily do PE but I knew I wanted to do a sort of practical job um, I probably wasn't intelligent or no I wasn't intelligent enough to consider medicine or veterinary or anything like that and physio sort of fitted the mold you know middle of the middle of the road grades and practical involved you know human body human science and um, something that interested me so yeah, that was it. That was it. I applied and, and um, went to university at the age of 18 then. Right. Fish guards a great name, isn't it? I'm not heard of that once. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there is there is a Welsh show um, on TV that people take people take the piss out of fish guard. I won't go into it, but yeah, there'll be a few people that know about it. <laughs> right. You can do if you want. It sounds quite interesting. <laughs> No, I won't. <laughs> so when you were looking at where to study then, like, uh, what are, the, are there any incentives for studying in Wales? I know in Scotland, if you're Scottish, you get it free, don't you, if you if you stay there? Are there any incentives to, like, what yeah, were the were, options you were looking at? There were Cardiff, you know, very good physiotherapy school. In fact, I, I ended up doing my master's there, you know, a few years later. Um, uh, but I sort of felt... I wanted to get away a little bit further, further afield, um, experience something different. I, I was, you know, really into my rugby. I was playing a lot of rugby and I knew that I would probably, if I went to Cardiff, end up coming home every weekend and playing rugby for Fishguard, um, which I did end up doing a few years later. But um, yeah, I just wanted to, wanted to get out, get away, probably get away from the farm so I didn't have to come home and milk as well. <laughs> um, and yeah, it, it served me well as well. So Lambton was a really good school. Um, you know, I'm, I'm sure, as John mentioned before, we had a cracking group, really good split of people, 50-50 really in terms of men and women, and I, and everyone just got on. So it was just a really good, really good crack there. Mm, that's quite a mature thing to, to do, though, because I remember, I think I was the opposite. So when I was going to university, I was like, I remember being bright white when I was going there, absolutely in myself, because it's like my first first day away. So I, I was in Manchester, so I wasn't far away. But you actively wanted to did you did you regret that at any point that you thought actually I am too far away? Well, yeah, my my folks dropped me off, um, and I, they never came back until I till I graduated. Um, and when they left, I realised I didn't have a towel. I like hadn't packed properly at all. You know, I, I sort of packed as if I was going on holiday. So um, I remember I washed and dried myself with like a t-shirt or something for two or three days until I realised I could actually go to a shop and buy a towel. You know, so no, I wasn't very prepared. Um, you know, I just I just wanted to get out, get out and, you know, meet some different people, I suppose. Right. And were you phased at all about going away? And it was Southampton, wasn't it, that you guys were in? Yeah. Um, no, not really. I, I, I think in my head, I just I knew I wanted to go to university. I knew I wanted to go and, and you know, um, experience you know, something different and totally different. Bear in mind, Fishguard is such a small town. Everyone knows everyone, you know. Um, so, no, I think I was just quite headstrong at that time. You know, I just want to go away, meet meet different people. And, you know, luckily on the first night, I think I bumped into John Hammond, um, a couple of other lads that we, we all ended up living together. And we were thick as thieves straight away. So, you know, once once you found sort of your people, um, it's quite comforting. And um, obviously, I met plenty of other people on the way as well. Um, but just very fortunate, you know. It can it can take a whole year, it can take two years sometimes till you meet a couple of people that you know you really connect with. So um, just really lucky that, that that happened, I suppose. Yeah, no, definitely, definitely. That's 
wasn't my experience but anyway it's not about me this one so uh, that's uh, <laughs> that's good so in terms of did you remember the, the the random guy that john mentioned that walked out after about three months of being there and he's like where have you, where have you been yeah well i i heard him tell that story and i remember thinking we had one in our corridor as well because i was in a different block and um they were all computer science and we, we had almost exactly the same experience in our block. So I suppose, you know, the courses were a lot different then. And like like John said, we we were sort of nine till five. Um, you've got to be in and register every day. So you wouldn't necessarily see some people. But I, I do remember when we were there, there was the meningitis scare as well around that sort of sort of time, late 90s. Um, and I remember coming back and one of my flatmates was just white as a ghost he had the sort of marks on his arm and they were going, oh, listen, we, we think he's got a touch of flu. And I was like, no, no, this guy hasn't got, you know, so he ended up getting whisked, whisked away in an ambulance. But um, yeah, I suppose it was just completely different um, because we, as it was as physios, because you spent so much time together, you you didn't necessarily get get a chance to mix with your own flatmates that much. Yeah, and then so that group, the, the the physio group that you became friends with and, and were like work with. So, what was that like in terms of that dynamic that you had there? Like, were you together a lot of the time? That was it intense or what? Yeah, yeah, we were really. I suppose we, you know, we'd we'd eat together and have all the lectures together. Then we, as a group, ended up living in the same same house. But I mean, it was a time of our lives. I'd I I'd happily go back to university and do it all again. It was brilliant. You know, it was just such a good, we had such a good sense of humour as a group. And it wasn't just our small group, the wider, the wider group of, of people on the course. And maybe it's just physios, really. You've got similar mindsets. You work hard, play hard. So every day was just, was just a great laugh, really, apart from, you know, sort of Thursday mornings after Wednesday nights, really. <laughs> So and then in terms of like what your plans for this, like even when you were moving away, did you envisage coming back to Wales and being physio at Welsh rugby or or, or wherever? I remember there was a point I was I was playing rugby and I, I you know I played rugby until I was in my early thirties, but there was a point obviously where you're ambitious and you want to try and move up, and um, it wasn't when I was in university. It was probably a bit later, but I remember having a clear like oh actually. The chances of me being uh, working in professional sport are going to be as a physio and not as a rugby player. Um, you know, although I, I loved playing and I loved, you know, I was ambitious myself. I sort of quickly realised that it was a ceiling to my rugby playing ability, but I could I could go a little bit further as a physio. And um, and I suppose at that point, starting to re- was starting to really enjoy the sort of sport stroke musculoskeletal side of things as well so yeah they probably married up together it was probably would have been a bit later because I went to New Zealand to work and I got injured out there playing and then ended up working in it with with a rep rugby team out there and that would have probably been the point where I was like well yeah here we go this is this is much more likely and actually it's it's a possibility that I can maybe control more you know just by sheer hard work and bloody mindedness Right. So at that point, then, did you envisage that you ideally would have been playing at a higher level and then working in the NHS or, or equivalent or something? Yeah, I think so. I think, you know, I would naturally went into the NHS after finishing Southampton. I did a year in the hospital there, I did a year of um, ward based rotations and then moved um, to West Wales. Um, there was a there was a, a job going in our local hospital working in the gym, basically, you know, sort of um, gym rehab and uh, musculoskeletal rotations, which clearly I wanted to do. So I I moved from the bigger hospital back to West Wales and, and it worked out because I could I could work and play for my local rugby team again and, uh, um, you know, see how it see how it went from there. Um, you know, I had an ambition beyond that, really, that I'd always had that I wanted to work and travel as a physio, you know, at that time. It, and it, it's similar now, you know, it's it's one of the benefits of being a physio, isn't it, that you can move around. So once I realised that was that was the case, I started looking at how I could get my registration to work in New Zealand then and, you know, work there, play rugby and experience all of that. 
And was it easy to get like the visa, but also registration? Is that just easily transferred over? No, no, it was a bit of a um, bit of a mission. There were you would have a portfolio, lots of letters of good standing from different governing bodies, CSP, HCPC. Um, there wasn't an exam, but there was a lot of information gathering and bits and pieces you had to get together at the time. Um, so that took that took about a year anyway, you know, by which time I'd done my two year rotations and was sort of ready to to pick up, you know, something different. Right. And then at university, did you have to do you have to do a dissertation or anything? Or was it all practical? No, we did a dissertation at the end. So I did a dissertation on neoprene. It was the neoprene knee sleeve. Remember them? Right. Yeah. <laughs> So that's was, interesting yeah. that with the alter g link because that was near neo, neoprene as well wasn't it with the oh yeah yeah the neoprene shorts yeah 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 what was the um, what was your dissertation in then so it was joint position sense basically proprioception does wearing a neoprene sleeve increase your joint position sense using then a kincom and then you'd you'd um place place the participant in a position and they'd have to replicate it um, I think they had three different positions that they had to try and find, and then you put the sleeve on and they'd repeat it. Right. Is it so, interesting? I think I can't remember. I think I think it did make a difference. <laughs> I, I don't think it was the best project, to be honest. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm not the best at sort of um, writing that many words, you know. So, um, yeah, I, I got you know I got by. I think I got a two one in the end. Yeah, no, I can definitely empathise with minimal wording. My very <laughs> short emails and stuff, but yeah, no. Um, so then in terms of that trip to New Zealand then, so you'd gone through all of the, the paperwork, etc. Did you envisage how long you were going to be going over there for? No, not really. Um, I thought, you know, a couple of years, uh, maybe maybe longer, you know, just see see what happens really. Um, I did want to do a couple of years in New Zealand and then come and then maybe do a stint in Australia as well. Um, I never never managed the Australia leg. We, I think we ended up going, we followed Wales around in the Rugby World Cup. Um, and at that point, it felt like I need to get back and see family because it had been two years, you know. So um, that's probably a, an itch that I still need to scratch. But uh, yeah, two, it was around about two years in the end I stayed out there. And so you were playing rugby at the same time when you were over there? Yeah. And what was that like in terms of playing in New Zealand, like, like the home of rugby? Like, how, What was the, the difference in standard as well as just the general facilities and expectations? Yeah, similar really. I mean, I played in two different clubs in different areas of New Zealand. One was the, in the Bay of Plenty and the other one was in um, Thames Valley, which is sort of just on that sort of corridor on the way from Auckland on um, down. Um, you know, they're both sort of first division clubs and then the way the system works, then you have your provinces and then you've got your super teams and what have you. So um, I think the thing is that the average New Zealand rugby player is very good. You know, their skill level is very good. They can catch pass. Uh, so, that, so the speed of the game is quicker as a result because there's less error in the game. Um, so the first few games, you're just red faced ab and it's boiling hot as well. You know, we, we're used to playing in the mud and rain in West Wales. Um, so yeah, the first the first few games are, are a real shock to the system, but obviously it brings you know you bring yourself up a little bit. Um, you know you get you're getting used to playing against bigger physical animals as well because generally the New Zealanders are big are big men, and then you've got the Islanders as well. Um, so you know I definitely felt I, I improved as a rugby player. I got injured both seasons <laughs> to the point where I couldn't play to finish the seasons out. But, um, you know, the experience was brilliant. And then, you know, that led, that gave me the opportunity to to pick up um, the role as a physio with, with some of the provincial teams as well then. And in terms of the physio then, how different was that for the Kiwi physios over there? I mean, at, at that time, again, because they've got a really good athletic base, the, the, a lot of their fitness is outside of the gym. You know, they 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 flog... They run the run the legs off the boys a lot, whereas I suppose over here we spend a bit more time gym based. I mean, we're talking twenty years ago as well. Um, but so so that yeah, I mean the physio work, I, they're, they're quite hardy, you know. Uh, similar to, similar to sort of um, my time in rugby league, you're more more often than not trying to pull them off the field 
then convinced them to get on there, um, you know, for their own safety. So, yeah, yeah, it was, you know, different times. Um, you know, things have certainly changed since. There's a lot more protocol around. Um, but it was a great, you know, great place to learn your trade. And, uh, and and it's not just the physio. You you learn to work with fitness coaches. You learn to to work with with coaching staff. Um, you know the culture of what they're trying to create as a team environment. All that kind of stuff sort of starts to shape you as to you know how how a how sports medicine or physio actually works. Mm. Yeah, and then when you're in Australia, then do you, you say you did do the the World Cup. You went over to do that there. No, that was that was purely on a socialising, drinking, drinking. Well, you, uh, you went over to Australia to do yeah, it, yeah. though. Yeah. So what, but then at that point, did you did you have any thought whatsoever that you thought actually I might be coming over here from a work perspective and working with the WRU? So whilst I was in New Zealand, um, Wales Wales senior squad played New Zealand in Hamilton, where I was living. And at that point, Wales had restructured their professional games. So they'd just gone from the club game to the regions that now stand with the Scarlets and Blues and Ospreys um, and Dragons. So they'd, they'd advertised for physios and I cheekily applied as a, you know, there was a head physio and then an assistant physio role. And I'd applied um, from New Zealand, I'd applied to, to be head physio for one of the regions. Um, I thought, well, what have I got to lose, you know? And um, Mark Davis, who's Carcass, the, the Welsh physio, who's just retired with us, um, emailed me and said, I'd be interested to meet you in Hamilton, have a chat. Um, and, you know, he, he obviously wanted to suss me out. Um, so we did. We had a coffee. And um, he then said, listen, you know, the head, the head jobs are gone. But if you if you're interested in working with one of the academies, then um, there, there'll be something coming up. And so I, that that was... I suppose the first point I was like, well, oh, right, okay, this could actually be a career. Um, so in my mind, then Australia went from being, well, I'll work there to I'm just going to party now because I'm going to get on a head back and try and nail nail down a job. Right. Yeah, you know, nice. Well, I was there for the Lions tour in 01, I think that was. So that was it was 03, wasn't it? The uh, yeah, that's right. the World Cup. What was that like being there for that? And um, obviously England won it, so that's probably not as good for you, but. <laughs> Well, it was it was good because it was a turning point for Welsh rugby. You know, we I mean, we pushed England pretty close in the quarterfinals um, played really well against New Zealand. There was a group of players coming through that ended up winning the Grand Slam in 2005. You know, it was our first Grand Slam in 27 years. So um, it was a turning point because, you know, I grew up in the 90s where Wales generally didn't win much. You know, we, we would we wouldn't turn over the. The big, you know, big three Southern, Southern Hemisphere teams. Um, so it, there was tough times, you know, and we we were desperate for a bit of success, and it was you could see it starting to turn a little bit there. Mm, yeah, well, no, definitely, definitely. So then, is that you, you move back to move back to Wales, and what was that? To, what was the role you took on then? Um, it was academy um, physiotherapist with the Scarlets, uh, Tlenetli Scarlets. Uh, academy physio and then support you know sort of like the number two if you like um at that point there were only really one and a half physios in each region you know it's completely changed now but um so i looked after the academy and then and then the the the, the main squad so um yeah it was great you know having come back from new zealand I, I was confident that i could treat you know most things then good thing about working in in new zealand is because of the way the private system works you see so much acute caseload. Um, you know, you'll see someone with a sprained ankle who's walked in that day. You get to you get to rehab them through. So I'd seen, I'd done my hours, if you like, my patient mileage, because um, I'd see fifteen to twenty people a day. Um, you know, over the two years. So um, at that point, I felt confident that I could I could take on most things. You know, and again, pretty headstrong. You know, I can I can sort anything out. <laughs> You know, you are, aren't you, when you're young? <laughs> so that was a full-time position then that you went into that. And that, yep. what was the setup like in those those facilities? Uh, I mean, archaic, really. Uh, we were at Stradie Park, um, you know, Tlenetli's sort of 
um, original ground, amazing, amazing stadium. You know, they'd beaten the All Blacks there. There's so much history there, but the actual infrastructure the, the, was was sort of falling down a little bit. And uh, so we'd have wind whistling through, you know, knocking the knocking the ceiling tiles and what have you. We'd be wearing our hat, beanie hats, treating players in the winter. Um, but it was, you know, a great crack. And and the start really of um, the professional era or the or the first you know wave of professional players in rugby union. Um, so there was still echoes to the amateur era. We'd still have a good time. Um, you know, probably more than we we should have. Um, but it was you know it was a great crack and um, a good bunch of players to work with. And so what was that like then, just in terms of what do you prefer out of like that that period when you go in there and it's like you say, it's on the cusp of becoming professional or is professional to now where I can imagine it's pretty much no no stone is left unturned, budget's not really a big problem if you're going to do this stuff, I presume. Mm. It's interesting because we're now in the generation of players where they've come through academies. So all they've ever known is, you know, the academy system. Whereas, you know, that group of players then were, they were farmers, builders, you know, mechanics, um, you know, so, so, so you'd have completely different conversations probably to what you have now. Um, you know, the, the, the group now are obviously much more driven because they've, they've got this pathway that they're on and it's got to succeed. Um, it's not to say it's not, it's, it's still a good crack. You know, we have, we have a great crack in, in our physio area. Um, but yeah, it is interesting when you look at the different personalities that you have, you know, or had in that in that period of time, you know, and and I suppose that's why, you know, come after games, then we'd all go out as a group and let our hair down and um, enjoy each other's company, probably more much more than we should have. And is that is that pretty much off the table now that the medical team interact with the players? No, no. Do you mean do we still interact? I mean, yeah, we do. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. as in out, out socially, like celebrating oh, or whatever. Yeah, I suppose that's different now. Um, you know, there's there's times where, um, it, you know, you're clearly not gonna you're not gonna go out and and um, with the players until there's there's been a significant game, for example, and everyone lets their hair down. You know, it's um, from that that point of view, it's different. But also, what happens is you as you grow older as well, there's separation from from you, you know, when I started, I was 24 or 25. So I was similar age profile to a lot of the players. Um, you know, they, 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 they're they sort of like your mates, if, if you like, you know, at that period of time. Um, and then as you get older, you know, you've got kids, you get married and what have you, and they're still, they're still younger and you're getting further and further away from them, you know, almost a generation away from them. So, yeah, it's just a natural progression that happens, really. And so how long were you at the academy for then? So I did five years with um, Clenetley, um before my wife got a job. So I got married. My wife got a job um, with The Times in London. Um, so I was just I was just running. I just bought a house. I was running a physio clinic on the side and she got she went and um, she won The Times Photographer of the Year. And with that became became a job. So she was brilliant what she was doing. And I had I was you know obviously had to support her and follow so i started looking for jobs up up in london um so that we could try and you know support her career as well then um which is where uh, harlequin's rugby league came in then yeah god that's amazing she won the uh, photographer of the year yeah yeah she's uh, she's very much more clever than i am <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So, what was it like moving to Harlequins? Uh, it was great. Uh, probably one of the best moves. I, I mean, at that that time, just before you know, I got I got married and met my wife, if you like. Um, I, in my mind, was going to stay at uh, Finetley. Um, You know, I couldn't see any different. I had a clinic running on the side. Um, you know, I sort of thought at some point maybe I'll be able to progress into the senior role. Um, and then obviously all of a sudden things changed. So um, I looked, I interviewed at um, a couple of other places and then um, Pat Moran, who was um, my lead physio at Schnethley, he'd, he'd worked in Leeds and he'd had a message, Leeds Rhinos, 
and he'd had a message, do you know a physio wants to work in London? Just again, circumstance, um, you know, really fortunate. So I went up and met Brian McDermott, um, had a good, had a conversation with him, you know, much, much less formal than some of the other interviews I've had where you had to sort of present and go through a, a demonstration and all sorts of um, sort of fancy things. We just sat down, had a coffee and had a chat. He asked me about my principles or um, culture, cultural things. And then he rang me as I was walking out, walking out of the car park and said, you got the job. So nice. happy days, happy days. And it was a great, great crack as well. You know, re really mm -hmm. good three years. So in terms of that, I mean, I find that really interesting, like principles, culture, we were chatting beforehand on just like teams, et cetera. But what, how would you answer that then if someone says, what are your principles? Like what are the, the main things for, to develop a good culture in a team? What, what would they be? Um, I'm trying to think back. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not religious, but I do believe in being a good person. So um, when it comes down to culture and, and, you know, I've sat in lots of meetings where you talk about, you know, this year we're going to be honest and relentless and blah, 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 blah. Um, I just think you should always be that. So, um, you know, Ben Warburton, who I worked with at the Blues, is a good mate of mine. We always laugh, but we basically just say, listen, just don't be a dick. You know, just just be a good human being. And um, uh, that, that's sort of what I how I how I hang my hat. You know, I, like I say, I'm not religious, but I do believe in, you know, good morals, good values and um, people around you being in, being of the same ilk. And then if you get the right people in the right, you know, with the right characteristics, then you're not going to be too far off. And that doesn't doesn't matter what department you're talking about. Um, but I certainly, you know, I want good blokes if, when I'm employing people. I want them to be a good, good, solid bloke first. Um, and then, yes, and they need to be good at whatever other skills that we demand of them. And how do you assess that then? How do you assess someone's characteristics? Um, I mean, there's different, you know, you look at social media now, you can you can sort of go and look at their, their profiles if you want. You know, that, that's usually the last thing I would do. Um, my last yeah, don't, don't do, don't, don't do, because then you judge me on mine, then that wouldn't be good. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's all, that's all changed as well now, though, because of just of the nature of it all anyway. But um, um, but I would ask them things like, you know, what's your influences? You know, who who do you respect? Things like that. You know, what do you do in your time off? Um, you know, because you, you want them to be able to fit into a, a wider team, not just your medical team. Can people fit into a wider group of people? And you look at sport now, you've got analysts, um, the S&C guys, you've got the coaching group. You know, it's a huge um, staff, really, in, in, the, in, in these organisations, let alone your own medical team that might have four or five people in it. I think that's something that's come up a lot in the, these chats that we've had is that the, the clinical skills is kind of is secondary to having someone that you trust and which I guess it does make sense but you, sometimes you wouldn't always naturally think that you just think all right you've got the the most intelligent people in in these jobs or as you're saying that character is is more important than, than those sides which again does make sense yeah it is and obviously you want them you want them to be passionate about whatever sport you know or team you're working with so Another thing that I always consider is why why are they applying for the job? You know, are they are they into it because um, of physio? You know, they want to be an amazing physio, and and this this job gives them a vehicle to be a better physio, or are they in it because of rugby or the team because they passionately want that team um, to improve? And you know, they both will will bring different things, but you know, generally, I I want good people. I want them passionate passionate people that, that strive to win because if that's the case then the clinical stuff will come because they'll they'll want to learn and that's I certainly how I how I felt is I need to get better as a physio to help the team so I need to go and do whatever courses I need to do to upskill myself to help these guys get on the field because ultimately I want you know like as a proud Welshman I want Wales to win every game so you know I need I need to sort of make sure my skills are, are on the money to make sure you know that's a knock-on effect really um mm -hmm. yeah have you ever got it wrong in terms of someone's character i'm not asking to name names or anything but have you ever like taken someone on and you thought they were going to be right or maybe even you had an inkling that they weren't going to be right and then it's like no it's not working um yeah i suppose 
ish a little bit, but um, the, what I've always felt is, you know, when I've taken on interns and what have you, I will lay down the law, you know, and just say, listen, this is what we expect. And if if you're not going to hit this mark every day, um, you know, the, I'll give you one chance sort of thing. But, you you know, you can you can go and get another job somewhere else. Um, so I try to be or have tried to be as thorough as possible. You know, this is your job description. These are expectations. This are the principles that we work to as a department, um, whatever that might be, you know, how, how we keep the place clean or um, how we support each other, whether the way we the language we use in front of players, all that kind of stuff. Um, so that they're, they're going in with their eyes open. And, you know, when you if if they do fall foul, you can only that you can pull them back and say, listen, you agreed to that. If, you know, if you don't want it, then someone else will. Yeah, no, I think that's really interesting. Like even for, uh, we were talking as well before, just that clarity of what the expectations are. I, I know I've definitely got that wrong sometimes where you assume people know what they're doing and through maybe it's through their fault, but ultimately as the person in charge, you've got to say, look, this is what I expect. And yeah. having that clarity and that focus to say, this is what we expect you to achieve. I'll support you to do it as long as you're doing what you're doing. I think that's that's something which I've... I've become more clear on myself in the last mm -hmm. what few months even. I think there's times where you think, oh, you know, somebody somebody's made an error or whatever it may be, and you're thinking, right, is that have they made that error because of me? Because I ultimately haven't given them enough clarity and what have you. So your first reaction is to blow your lid. <laughs> and but then you've got to like rein it in and go, yeah, no, that's actually my fault again. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I it's so hard. Agree. We spoke about it before, didn't we? About you go from being clinical, you know, we're all you, all you, all you're doing is is treating and rehabbing people, and all of a sudden you've got to manage up. You've got to manage the coach, the coach's expectations, the CEO, um, you know, the money man or whatever it is. You're dealing with all these different people up, and then you've got a group of people working below you as well, um, and. You know, in some in some cases, when you have interns, for example, you've got to try and create roles for them um, to keep them busy as well. Um, and that's not something that happens overnight. You you, you know, you, you have got to have a sort of you've got to work with quite a few different people, I think, to start having that picture in your own head as to what managing a team looks like. Yeah. Yeah. Do you enjoy the management aspect of it? Yeah, I did. You know, I'm, I'm fortunate now. I do less and less of that now because I, I was in my role in the national squad. Um, you know, I'm, I'm part of a part of a, a group, really, part of a team, um, and I look after more of the governance of the game. But um, yeah, yeah, it is. You know, developing people is great when you're working with with other physios and you can see them following the pathway that you've come through. Um, and when you end up having people working with you that you've employed as well um you know you can you can have a really good crack as a group then yeah yeah no for sure so then go back to harlequins how long were you there for uh three years so we were super league and we it was we renamed to london broncos i think in my second or third it was the third year um so we were two years as harlequins rugby league playing at harlequins ground um and then the third year was was london broncos then um and it all sort of changed after i left then i think well now they've they're the league below um but it was a great crack great organization um lots of overseas uh players you know or what it felt like really was you know everyone was from away but that united us as a group so you're not you know your english-based players were from the north um you had lots of australians and kiwis and then you know we come from west wales so we and and they were and we talked about age profile i was in my early 30s there were lots of um players in their early 30s all having kids and all that sort of stuff it was just a really good good group of people at the time you know mm -hmm. and a different culture different culture of the way they were they went about their work very workmanlike um in the sense that they turned up did what they had to do no questions about anything. Um, and it just made it a good a good group to work with. So what's that different to what you'd experienced previously? And you were saying the culture was slightly different. 
I think that what was different for me is I I was obviously I changed roles, so I've gone from being assistant to lead. I was able to sort of push more of the injury prevention stuff that I was getting more and more interested in. Prehab was you know sort of growing at the time, screening, you know. Um, so so and they they were so receptive to that. You know, you're able to sort of try a few different things then um, and learn what what works for you, you know. Um, so from that point of view, it was great. You know, there, there was there was sort of scope to to progress my own skills and learn things. And I suppose a little bit out of the bubble of Wales as well, where, you know, if something something goes wrong. It's not in the national newspapers tomorrow morning, you know, so um, it's not quite that bad. But you know what I mean? It's the pro- profile of rugby in Wales is is very high. Um, so um, whereas, you know, rugby league at the time, um, you know, still still a still a big sport, but um, gave me sort of opportunities to to learn, learn as I went, if you like. Yeah, what were the differences between like the union and rugby players, uh, league players? The, the, I mean, there was a culture really that come. I, I'm not sure whether it had come from Australia or or Britain. I'm sure anyone that tells you that's worked in rugby league is, you know, you are like I mentioned earlier. You're more often trying to get them off the field. You know, they they'd have AC injuries, and just you know they just say well just inject it and I'll and I'll go back on and I'd be like well I, I can't inject it you know um so that, that there was no there was no stopping them really but in their minds especially some of the more um senior players they were of the ilk that I'm paid to be here and I need to get on the field every week um so you know you learn then clinically where to draw the line um you know things like your fitness tests return to return to play fitness tests You've, you've got to get them right to justify in your own mind that, OK, I'm, I'm allowing this player to play with whatever he, whatever he may be carrying. Um, but he still has had to tick, you know, some of these boxes and what have you. Um, so, yeah, you know, that that's that was interesting, you know. You, yeah. You, you yeah, well, we had um, we had a rugby, we had a few rugby league players when we had the Alter G in our clinic in Manchester. And I used to love doing those sessions because the tales they would tell you, it's just like, what? It's just like, these are proper, I'm not a real man. He's a, he's a man. <laughs> yeah. I just the strapping as well. And, you know, they'd have guards and all sorts of things that, you know, you'd, you'd, um, you'd strap on because they'd maybe broken a bone somewhere before, you know, and <laughs> so your strapping skills get a lot better as well. Cause it could be a good hour that you're having to strap. And, you know, there's only you and one other physio. So, you know, you're, you're both flat out trying to, prepare them for the for the um for the game you know so and there'll be a long queue with them all with different bits and pieces that need they're all slightly different you know and oh, no, i don't like my uncle done that way i like four stirrups and one lock and all oh, this sort of stuff so yeah a lot of the australians tend to teach you how to strap basically <laughs> nice so then what made you move back or oh, out of london um we had we had our first child and um um the, the the head of medical head physio stroke head of medical role came up at Cardiff Blues, um, so Prav um, was lead head of medical, was still is head of medical at the WRU. I knew Prav from previous, and um, you know we got in touch and yeah I went for it and fortunately got the job. So that was it really. M- moved back to Wales. And what was that like moving moving back? Yeah, I mean it. It was something I felt I needed to do. I, we, I would happily have stayed in London. We loved working for the club and what have you. It was a bit unstable financially at the time. Um, so, you know, we were worried having had kids. But I also knew that I needed to manage a bigger team, you know, a, a bigger team, medical team in a bigger organisation, if you like. Um, and, you know, Cardiff, you know, capital city, that that was, you know, so attractive. I couldn't, couldn't not look at it, really. Um, and it, you know, it, it did, it, it did serve that purpose. I was able to come in, um, obviously had the experience of leading in, in Harlequins and have my own sort of take on how I want to run the department. Right. And was that based at the Vale of Glamorgan then? Yeah. yeah. Do you have That's an, a unique spot, I would say, from all of my time being involved in it, where you've got Cardiff City, you've got the WRU, were they, were they there then as well? So you've got a load of these teams in the Brilliant. same place. Great facility. We shared the building with Cardiff City. 
Um, so, you know, you'd get to knock heads with the physios there, medical team there. Um, you know, the, the facilities were superb. You know, we actually had a physio room with a window. You know, I've been working in a store cupboard for the previous three years. So um, any physio room with a window is 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 pretty good in my book. Um, but, it, but, you know, we had a good aspect. We could look into the gym, um, look out onto the field. Um, I was able to sort of recruit my own staff and, um, you know, put a bit of a stamp on how I wanted things to work. You know, we mentioned injury prevention before, screening, injury prevention, um, recovery, whatever modalities, you know, things that you you feel needs to be implemented. You know, I had a, I had a bit of a, a clean, sh- clean sheet to do that. Yeah. So what was that like then? So Sean Connolly was probably there then, wasn't he, um, at Cardiff City? And like, did you did you, you said you interacted? How how would that work? Um, we see each other most days, really. But um, you know, there'd be times where we might share. At that time, for example, uh, the Graston therapy was was becoming a big thing. Or I asked them, you know, using tools and bits and pieces. Um, so we'd share things like that, you know. Um, I think GPS would have been something that was growing and growing at the time. Um, yeah, so you know, even now we we, uh, we keep in touch with with Sean because he's he's sort of been away and come back in that time. But yeah, I mean, you know, it's just a great to have to have the facilities, you know, that we had at Cardiff Blues and Welsh Rugby Union on the doorstep, um, working with different people, working with different fitness coaches, different coaches again, all these things sort of increase your development and like i said then managing a bigger team managing up you know finding which which are the key stakeholders in the business to work with is, is important you know kit man <laughs> chef financial controller <laughs> so what, what how, how would you do that then because i know like you're looking at an alter g system or whatever like that how would you like manage up because again, you you normally you probably want the equipment of whatever it is you're looking at. How like trying to get that PFD on board or the financial control or whatever? Like how how hard is that? Yeah, it's not easy. You know, you've got to justify it. You've got to justify it financially. Um, I think we looked at with the Alter G, for example, how many players used it um, over with whatever injuries they had. How many? So if if a player had used it with an MCL or you know maybe a stress reaction or something. If that player had returned maybe a week earlier, then we worked out on an average wage, how much money is back on the field. So we tried to equate it to, to finances. You know, so if over over a period of six months, this machine has helped 10 people, for example, and they've all returned a week earlier and, and their average wage is this, then we've got, you know, that 10 people back on the field. That's in effect, you know, put the business um you know, it doesn't the maths don't quite work out like that? But that's that's how I made sense of it and justified us having this 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 you know equipment. And you know, the other thing is making sure that um, you know the right people see people see this see the equipment in use. Um, you know, something like the Alter G is very visual, isn't it? So you can get quite easily yeah. go, wow, this guy he couldn't walk two week two days ago, but look, he's running he's running now. You know, that's that's doesn't you don't have to be a medic to realise that's good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it is. It is interesting. Interesting. All of that. It's, it still feels like sometimes in those arguments. You get the FD on a good day, and it's like, yeah, okay. And then on a bad day, it's like no chance. Get. Yeah. Usually, so those conversations you try and have them after a win. <laughs> Don't have them after and, a loss. Yeah. No, that that definitely makes sense. And then, what was the what was the interaction like between the footballers and the rugby players then at the at the same training facility? Um, I mean, they, they, they'd obviously say hello and, you know, sort of bump into each other, but um, there wouldn't be much more than that. They, quite often, very different schedules, to be fair. You know, the footballers come in a little bit later. They might have one session and they're out. I think probably most of the time they'd be looking at them thinking, what are these guys doing? Because obviously our guys would be out, you know, pushing prowlers, lifting weights, knocking seven bells into each other. And then an hour later, they'd be out doing it again, you know. It's quite often that you'll have a second session in rugby. Um, so, yeah, the, the, the sort of the actual passing of, of, of the groups would be would be much less than what you'd think, even though you're in the same building. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then so how long were you at the Blues for? Um, six years. 
Yeah. And then did, was it were you straight on to the WRU from there? Yeah. Yeah. Very, very fortunate, really. Like um, uh, Prav approached me about the role I do now, which which is obviously national squad physio. And then I look after the governance of the community game um, as well. So, you know, um, things like trauma courses, um, looking at defibs in the community, facilities, equipment, all these all these sort of key areas, education of concussion. Um, so, yeah, that's that's where I've been for the last five years now. Right. So that governance piece, was that something that you wanted to do or was that something that was just need, they needed someone to do it? Yeah, it was a bit of both, really. Um, you know, it was something that was needed to be done. I mean, Prav, to be fair, was doing everything, senior and and community game. It's a huge role. And, you know, other, other countries have, you know, a number of people doing it. So it needed to be split a little bit. It's something that I've learned loads from, from doing. Slightly different demand again. You know, you're still having to communicate with different stakeholders within within the union, you know, present proposals to board, um, you know, to try and pass through policy, if you like. But very rewarding when when things do, you know, get get pushed through. Um, you know, for example, last year we we got a defib um, in every club in rugby club in Wales, and that had taken a fair bit of, um, you know, sort of proposal and um, a bit of work to try and get that passed. Really, it's not because you you think you look at something, you think that shouldn't take too long, but you know, there's quite a lot of policy to get through until until you get to the point where it's, there's a big tick in the box. Anything public sector is, yeah, absolutely mental, isn't it? How long it's going to take? Yeah, yeah, but when it when it when it does pass, and you know, like I played community rugby, um, I know what it's like to be, you know, in in the wild west, you know, with, with very little facilities. So having having an idea of what that knowing what that's like does help me in my role now, where I know that okay, that we need the basics done well. You know, you need the basic facilities, you need the basic equipment, and we need the basic understanding of how to use that if you're a volunteer in the community game. Mm. Yeah, no, it is. It's really interesting. Like, do you think that the Ericsson incident in the Euros had played a bearing on that happening? Because all of a sudden you see them everywhere popping up, mm-hmm. just even in city centres. It certainly helped. Um, you know, they, no one ever wants to see to see it, but... It certainly helped when you're trying to justify again very visual isn't it so you know it, 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 when you're trying to justify something and then an event like that happens um and nobody ever wants to see that in your local rugby club it does it does help when you're trying to push things through yeah now that was hideous hideous watching those sort of incidents yeah. um, and then wru you just said like welsh rugby is like absolutely massive you had some really high profile players through there like what's it like when you've got these world superstars whether it's half penny or um george north or any of these people what is there any different management technique to do in that like does that play a role in what you have to do um you, you know what i i'm pretty fortunate in that because i have been around a while now i i knew some of them when they were in under 18s in fact all three that you mentioned there, I knew when they were in the academy system. Um, I looked after them in the age of under eighteen, but they and they haven't changed. You know, it's it's usually the same, isn't it? All your best, you know, superstars and athletes, what have you, are still still very grounded and humble people. Um, and I've certainly found that with all all the best players I've worked with, are all usually the best people as well. Um, you know, they'll be the ones that will message you if something you know happens in in your life. They'll they'll be the people that go, oh, you know, well done. Um, I, I, a friend of mine's got MND, um, unfortunately, and we did a big fundraising thing for him recently. Um, and again, you know, the, the guys you name there and, and plenty of other ones, um, straight away were, how can we help? How can we support this? You know, so, you know, it, it is interesting. The, the, the more, the more I've worked with, you know, rugby players in particular, you do sort of feel like the best, the best athletes are also the best people. Yeah, no, it's really interesting, isn't it? That like character, how important character plays in that. And you may question as to is that character help them practice more, you know, be more pushing more to to, to become better. It's, it's it's really interesting to sort of see where does talent end and hard work take over. And like you were saying about the not just on the um, playing side, but on just general life side of medical departments or organisations. Yeah. 
Yeah, you know, and and the the you know we get paid for what we do, don't we? But they they still will appreciate when you've gone over and above, which you know you do you do at times because you're so desperate to get this person back on the field. You know, from from a selfish point of view, you want to see this. You know, one of these you know the best players in the world go out and perform for your team because you want you want your team to win. Um, so you know you will you will obviously go you know go a little bit further over and above to try and get get um, get these guys back on the field but they recognize it as well which is nice you know um and and you know the, 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 there's obviously plenty of others that wouldn't bat an eyelid to the fact that you've you've done whatever whatever but like you like you say the the better ones will always go I, i've not i've noted that you know mm, yeah no it's good to hear so then in terms of who who of people that you've worked with or just in life, other than John Hammond, obviously, but I've played a big role within your like career. Who who do you think has been influential in your career? Oh, it's a good question. I mean, it's interesting because you'll you'll have different coaches that will guide you, um, fitness coaches that you work with. Um, I think, you know, it's not just the clinical side. We mentioned Prav earlier. Um, I've known Prav since he was he was back at Wasps and I was at the Scarlets and we've always sort of like you know sort of um, kept in contact. So I think there's there's probably a group of people that I I still keep in contact with now just to sort of um, knock heads with every now and then. And you mentioned John Hammond, um, Ashley Draper, who who um, is head of um, medical at um, Auckland Blues. He was another one of our friends in in university and we. We spend a bit of time on Skype together, comparing notes and you know trying to trying to learn from each other. Um, and then I look back to my time at Scarlets. Wayne Proctor, we trained together every day for about a year. He nearly nearly killed me, I think, but um, I learned so much about you know different training you know training mechanisms, energy systems, all that sort of stuff. Um, and I could go on and on really, but I think um, it, it's 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 knowing what you know what you where the holes are in in your knowledge base and having the right people to to pick the brains of. Um, Alec Walters would be another one that I that I'd uh, I'd mention. We 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 lived together a while back. Alec is, was the fitness coach for South Africa um, when they won the World Cup a couple of years ago. So he's he's had an amazing career around the world, and he's someone that I lean on as well. If I if I just want someone to give me a a down the line opinion on something, you know. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's, there can be what's the next what's the next fad or something else new that's come up you know and sometimes you just want, want someone to go yeah that's that's worth a go or um yeah <laughs> yeah and then last question you've you will have had loads of different high points in the career but are there any particular one or two things that really stand out you just think wow this is incredible to be a part of this yeah i mean i mean i'm Every every time I go into work for Wales, it's, you know, I'm to think that I'm I'm working for for the Welsh squad is is an amazing thing, really. I, I, you know, it's not something I I, I take lightly. Um, and then last year, you know, I was fortunate to go on the the British Lions tour. Even even with it being a COVID sort of um, tour, I still pinch myself. I didn't believe it was going to happen before. I couldn't believe I was there when when I was. And I can't believe it's happened after. So, um, you know, that'll be one thing that, um, you know, when I, if I do ever sit down in my chair and retire, I'll be able to go, I did that. I was, I was there as part of that group of people um, that represented the British Lions. So, um, yeah. And, you know, I still have imposter syndrome now, you know, when I turn up in camp and you're working with these amazing players and at the top of the game, it's hard not to have imposter syndrome sometimes and go, why am I here? You know? How do you deal with that then? Oh, I suppose lots of sort of self counseling in the sense like, hang on a minute, you know, you've, you've done X, Y, and Z to justify the right that you're here. Um, you know, you have put the hard yards in, which I can confidently say, you know, I've, I have worked in lots of different environments, I've been the other side of the world, um, so this is try. This is something that I try and repeat to myself when I'm having imposter syndrome. <laughs> and then you're like, right, come on, then, let's go. Yeah, 
take action and get on with it. Yeah. 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 <laughs> no, no, I think that's good. No, John, really appreciate it. It's really good to hear your story and um, I appreciate Thanks, you mate. sharing that. And uh, yeah, hopefully we can um, catch up for another gout show soon. Yeah. Love that. <laughs> All right. Cheers, John. Thanks, mate. Bye-bye. Yeah,